Good morning, everyone. Can you hear okay? Can everybody hear okay? Uh, welcome to Camp B and to our Purple Heart event. We're so honored to have all of you here and our Purple Heart recipients. Uh, first of all, we want to start with an invitation. Invitation? Oh, gotcha. <laughs> By Lewis Williams, please. Dear God, we have so many men and women that have given their all, but we have so many others that were able to come through whatever horrors they were in. We bless, ask you to bless them, bless the families of those that have gone on before us. Again, dear God, we thank you for the privilege of being here and this lead us and guide us and help us ever to remember to pray for the leaders of our country. I'm not a politician, dear God, and I'm not naming anyone. We just want to lift them all up to you, and we want your will to be done in our country. Again, thank you, dear God. Bless these men and women in your holy and most precious statement. We ask and pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much. Would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Thank you so much. Have a seat. The next, the next speaker I would like to introduce is Don Warren, who is a past city councilman and is running for mayor for this coming fall. So we welcome you. He's been a big supporter of Camp B and other things in the community related to our veterans. So we welcome you. Good morning, everyone. Camp B is, is a fabulous place. And I just want to thank, first of all, thank everyone that has been a part of Camp B and has contributed time, talent, resources to make this place available to the veterans. It's, it's much needed. Uh, I'm a civilian. I've, I've never served in the military. And when I was asked to say a few words, the only thing that came to my mind was, thank you for your service. Well. I felt led to read more about the Purple Heart, and I, and I read a lot. And it's pretty cool, and I didn't realize that every August the 7th is recognized as National Purple Heart Day in our country. The original Purple Heart was designated as a badge of, of military merit established by George Washington. The Purple Heart, and these are things I didn't really realize, the Purple Heart is awarded to members of the armed forces of the U.S who are wounded by an instrument of war in the hands of an enemy, or is awarded to the next of kin in the name of those who are killed in action or die of wounds received in action. I have learned that each person that has received the Purple Heart has a story. That's if they're able to come home and tell their story. As I read about the Purple Heart, I, I got a little bit distracted when I started reading about dust off. And it's D-U-S-T-O-F-F. -F, and it stands for Dedicated Unhesitating Service to Our Fighting Forces. Their mission is to save lives, not to take lives. These are the guys who go to the front line and beyond to rescue wounded soldiers. These guys move without hesitation, regardless of the circumstances, with one mission in mind, which is to save the wounded, knowing that they are putting their lives on the line. If you were wounded in action in Iraq or Afghanistan, you had more than a 90% chance of coming home with a heartbeat. In Vietnam, your chances were 76%. World War II, 70%. A gentleman by the name of Michael Novosel, a dust-off pilot, once saved 29 men when they were pinned down by enemy fire near Cambodia. In his entire career, he rescued 5,589 men during 2,500 missions. Men and women, just like we're here to honor and celebrate today. So to wrap it up, I want to thank each 
and every one of you for your level of courage, sacrifice that gives us the liberty of freedom that we take for granted. Once again, thank you for your service. Before I introduce the Purple Heart recipients, I want to talk a minute about it. The Purple Heart Medal is awarded to members of the Armed Forces of the United States who are wounded by an instrument of war in the hands of the enemy and posthumously to the next of kin in the name of those who are killed in action or die of wounds received in action. It is the only veteran service organization composed of combat veterans. So the Purple Heart Medal symbolizes this timeless and noble values of patriotism, honor, and courage, and they, which stands for the hallmarks representing our armed forces. The courageous men and women belong to and are honored by the military order of the Purple Heart Organization. So one of our speakers, first speaker will be Patrick Rogers. Um, he is a Vietnam vet. Uh, I'm not a Vietnam vet, excuse me. He, he fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he is a Purple Heart recipient. And he's also a hometown boy. So welcome, Patrick. Uh, welcome. Todd out here. I know I'll keep it brief. Uh, was awarded my Purple Heart for wounds in Afghanistan. See a bunch of Army, Navy, Marines. Marines, I got some colors for you later. The crayon for you. Uh, that's what it meant for me to have a Purple Heart. Uh, I like y'all. Y'all heard it a million times. So the uh, Enemy Mark Marksmanship Award. Got it now? Okay. Um, I was a flight medic. I took care of a lot of guys. Um, you know, we, we've been there. We know what it does to our family. When they get that phone call, I remember calling my wife at 3 a.m. from Afghanistan telling her I got blowed up. Uh, she wasn't overly worried because I called her, so that was a good thing. Um, you know, guys, uh, we've been around the block, we've done it. Uh, it's an honor to have it. I wish we didn't have it, most of us. Uh, but it's here, we did it. But thank you all for what y'all did, especially you Vietnam guys and guys older than that. Uh, I appreciate it. I got a ton of respect for all of you old timers. Uh, I went to war with toys we didn't have, and y'all still proceeded to uh, take care of business. So, uh, in that, I will leave it at that. But uh, God bless y'all. Thank y'all for coming out here. Uh, please keep supporting Camp V. Uh, and just have a blessed day, guys. Thank y'all. Thank you, Patrick. I know it's hard for some of you veterans to be acknowledged. I've been told that many times, but we still love and respect all that you represent and your service to our country. The next group I want to acknowledge is we have the Military Vel uh, Veterans Association that came on the motorcycles. And if all of you would stand, please, so that we can see who we are. And among those, we have a We have some Patriot Guard Riders as well. Some of you are, are that as well. So thank you. Thank you for your service. Michael Eubanks is a PGR or a Patriot Guard Rider as well as part of the Military Veterans Association. So you are our next Purple Heart recipient speaker, so please come up. And my name is Mike Eubanks, and yes, I am Patriot Guard Rider, Purple Heart Rider. And uh, other things we won't talk about <laughs> here now. Anyway, uh, I got in the way a couple of times in Vietnam, so over that, no, we're not heroes. We're just guys that happen to get in the way. Uh, most of us will tell you that. We just got in the way of stuff. We didn't go out there and say, please, and run up and stuff and say, please, I need to get in the way. <laughs> we don't do that. 
we're just guys, just Marines and soldiers and uh, corpsmen and uh, medics and stuff that just happened to be in the way of something that happened to us. And most of us, that's all we were. We weren't anything special other than we got in the way of stuff. And uh, when we came home from Vietnam in particular, it didn't freaking matter to anybody that we came home. It didn't matter if we came home wounded, if we came home dead, whatever, it didn't matter. And we appreciate the outcome out the people thinking about us now, and uh, we appreciate what people think now. And uh, we want all the guys and the ladies and men and women of the, of the services, what they do now, and we want all of them to know the Major Guard side of things, we'll never forget. And we will not allow the people to forget what you do now, because we know what you do, because we've done it. And we want you to understand that. And we know heroes are not born heroes, they are made heroes, because they actually go out that, they just get and do something because it's there, and that's what they are. Thank you. God bless all of you. Thank you, Michael. We appreciate it very much. We are so grateful for the service of our men and women of our military of all branches. And, who, and these people represent the level of courage and sacrifice that are precious gifts. And these and these provided the liberties and the freedom that we take for granted today. So thank you again and appreciate your coming and speaking. Uh, I would like to do a mention of all the Purple Heart recipients that didn't speak today. And so if you would stand when I mention your name. I just met most of you here just today. So Wayne Halen, thank you so much. And Monroe Meneke is representing his father, who was a Purple Heart recipient. And of course, Patrick Rogers. And Michael Eubanks. And Michael Eubanks. Thank you. And Raymond Ward. Thank you, sir. So these are our Purple Heart recipients, but there are many more that are part of this wonderful league of people. We have some Purple Heart tags that we had printed up for our veterans and Purple Heart recipients. So you want to call them to come up? Yeah. Okay, Wayne Hanlon, would you come up and... Monroe Meneke, in honor of your father. Patrick Rogers. Skip Michael, he's already got his. And Raymond Ward. Again, thank you for all of you coming to Camp V today. It is, um, this is a realized dream for us. We've worked on this project long before we purchased this property. And it's a dream come true to be able to serve and give services back to our veterans that need help in many areas of life, whether it's finding a job, a place to live, or whatever they're needing, we're here to help them. So please pass this information around to your fellow veterans. 
pass this information around to your fellow veterans because this is a project that we need as many veterans in our East Texas area to give them help, give them a helping hand. And everybody has tough times, and, and especially those veterans that are coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, and even some from Vietnam still struggling to get back into their normal lives. So we're here to help and, uh, and then come and just visit with us and be a help to the others that are still struggling. So come visit, even if you don't need a helping hand, please be a part of Camp B and any of the friends of the community. We welcome everyone. So thank you so much. Uh, in the final closing, we have a lady that is a retired teacher. I really can't say enough about her. She is a poet, uh, but an amazing writer. And many of her poems that she's written for veterans, which has been her passion, have made it all the way to Washington, to the Arlington Memorial. And so I welcome her, Donna Castle, to read her poem. And this will close out our program for today. Thank you. Good morning. One year ago, we were together, some of you wonderful and a year has passed. I've told many people about the Purple Heart program. Uh, they're all uh, in honor in all of, of that particular thing. I have to tell you two things sitting here. I, I won't be a boring English teacher. I don't think I was. <laughs> but when I did teach high school, you military people will love it. One of the young men in high school came up to me and said, Miss Castle, I've got to drop out. I'm tired of my parents and teachers telling me what to do. I'm joining the military. <laughs> do you know what you're saying? I am tired of people telling me what to do. And during Gulf War or Desert Storm, I don't remember the exact time, but I was at Robert E. Lee, e. Lee a couple of years and taught five classes of English and we did not have the internet. But I had a passion for the military. And I came up with an idea to adopt a soldier. And each of my five classes adopted someone from the Tyler area, if we could get the information. Might have been Army, might have been Navy. It was a variety of the different branches. And we would write, the students would write them letters. The uh, administration of Robert E. Lee and Tyler ISD approved it. We put those uh, sort of pen pal letters uh, to each soldier in manila envelopes, mail them to uh, wherever all the battle was. Those different military would write my students back. They sent them some MREs. <laughs> and we had a poster in front of the classroom for each of the five uh, honored uh, military with the things that they would send, and I promise you by the end of the year, most of those military came by the classroom to say thank you. Here is your poem of honor. America's Award for Bravery. Earned in combat during war. Heroic stories, part of history often told in national lore. Some are received after death. Others are given to those who survived. Elegant, esteemed, entitlement, revered tribute to be archived. Iconic purple heart design worn with patriotic pride. Military Badge of Merit, the, mo the medal most famously recognized. Old Brotherhood of Valiant Warriors, heritage of service above and beyond your part, respect and gratitude from all the citizens, honored recipients of the Purple Heart. Once again, thank you for coming. And I wanted to direct you to this table. We have some challenge coins with a donation of $20. You'll have a challenge coin and the money goes toward Camp B. And we also have uh, Frank Parr who has, a, has the uh, Honored Warriors Ranch. 
and we are selling some of his bracelets that he's made with Can't V on it and some of the dog tags. I love it. So if you would like any of these, please come by the table and see us. Thank you all once again for coming. Appreciate you. I got blown up a couple times and uh, that's just what happened. Were you in Vietnam? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, there's so much respect and honor that comes with this Purple Heart in 2020, but probably not when you returned from Vietnam. No, nobody gave a yeah. They didn't care if you, they didn't care if you uh, came back alive, dead, hurt, wounded, uh, messed up, whatever. They, nobody gave a rest, except for your family. So. It was just one of those deals, you know. You came back, you came back. Who gave her ass? Nobody. At what point in your life did you start to see a, a shift where suddenly the military is gaining respect? Probably in uh, 2000s, the mid 2000s, mid. When we started, the Patriot Guard started honoring, uh, started protecting the soldiers uh, and, uh, you know, uh, ceremonies because of the. Uh, uh, church that was uh, that was uh, protesting the ceremony of, of uh, fallen soldiers and stuff. Then you know, then you started seeing respect starting to happen. Before that, you really didn't. But but that, you know, and then start, all of a sudden, people started to say, "Gee, we need to respect these guys when they come home." Basically, the Patriot Guard started that, and we have we have made a, a d deal that we're never going to let another soldier in the Marine, Navy, or anybody else coming home, period. Or the, even if they didn't leave the States, it doesn't matter. Wherever they went, we no soldier is going to go un... un uh, appreciated. appreciated. That's a good word for it. So, uh, let me guess, it doesn't get old when you hear someone say thank you for your service. Uh, no, I, it's a hard answer, though, because you either say thank you, which makes no sense, so you say yes. But just to, to just for people to come up and say that and not spit, what a what a difference. Well, it's a little bit different. It's kind of a kind of a uh, okay, you know, because something that we didn't do that nobody did for years. I mean, 30, 40 years, 50 years, it just didn't happen. You know, so you kind of a, uh, at first it was a blind side, and then it started you starting to get used to it, which is kind of nice, but you know. And then talk about the brotherhood and meeting other Purple Heart recipients or other veterans. That must keep you going. Well, you it do does. Uh, the Patriot Guard keeps me going. Uh, uh, the Purple Heart Riders, which I'm, you know, uh, into very deeply. I'm a, a National Sergeant of Arms and mm -hmm. stuff, and and uh, we're a group of, of only wounded warriors. Uh, that's it. Period. We, there's nobody else in the group. <clears throat> we're not very big. There's only a couple hundred of us in the whole country. Uh, that ride motorcycles, and um, that keeps us kind of in a little brotherhood of our own. So, yeah. I uh, I'm a graduate of Emmett J. Uh, Scott High School here in Tyler. Uh, it shut down in the 70s, mm -hmm. and I joined the military. I uh, volunteered after spending a short time at TJC, and uh, two other friends of mine. We joined the Marine Corps in 1968 and from 1968 to 1970 I was uh, stationed in Quang uh, Tree Province as north of the, the DMZ what they call i uh, My mission was to search, seize and destroy the enemy uh, and uh, my job basically I was a squad leader my job was to run ambushes to protect the Air Force Base there in Da Nang. And uh, the first time I was wounded, we were on a night ambush. And uh, we were setting up an ambush, and while we were setting it up, we got ambushed. That was the first time I got wounded. And I was out of the country about, about four weeks. After that, they sent me back for my next part of my tour. I went back to my same squad. The next time, we were on a full-scale operation out in the Ashaw Valley. Okay. You may see that on YouTube or something. What we were, we were the uh, fodder. We were to go out and make contact with them and find out where they were, and then we would call in the 
big guns. Gotcha. And that was the last time I got wounded. After that, I was medevac, and I was mustered out and retired uh, February 10th, 1970. And uh, basically, since that time, I've been recovering. I came back, tried to find a job, couldn't find a job, so I went to school. I got my undergraduate degree from uh, uh, Tyler State College. After that, I went back, got my master's degree at University of Texas at Tyler. And from that, I worked 18 years at Tyler Pipe Industries as an industrial engineer. After that, I taught school for a little while. Couldn't stand the pressure. I couldn't shoot anybody. So then I was hired by Allstate Insurance Company. I worked for them for 23 years, and I retired in 2011. Now I'm back home in Tyler trying to survive with this pandemic thing. I don't know. That's why I don't go anywhere. I'm staying at home all the time. So you left that one to go to Allstate. They let you shoot people there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> with a camera. Oh. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me that. I was ready for that. Oh, wow, he got me there. <laughs> well, you know, when we used to go out and I did special investigations on fraud and stuff yeah. like that. And wow. Went to hurricanes. That was dangerous work when you would go to Louisiana and New Orleans and you're wading through water and you don't know whether there's a crocodile or something that's going to snap you up, plus the big rats and all of that stuff. It was kind of like a combat zone, but that's what you had to do to make a living. And so that's what it was. Did you, um, when you came back from the service, you know, was there any negative towards you or towards Vietnam veterans? Not me. You didn't have any problems then? <laughs> no, I was a matter of that. Right. But still, I mean, <laughs> oh, oh, you mean just in terms uh, of military. Walking mili down the street yeah, or? Military veterans didn't really get a lot of respect back in the 70s. Well, but you didn't have that issue. So I sure. learned how to avoid the snakes and the bandits and, and the hiccups in the road. And I probably had a few questions asked when I was in college. Mm -hmm. Asked me, uh, why did I do what I did? I said, my country called me to do a job. And I did it. Mm -hmm. And they said, did you have a conscience? I said, yeah, but I left it back on the base. <laughs> when you went out there. You had one thing on your mind, making it back and taking care of the guys you were responsible for. Now, we didn't kill babies. The only time babies were killed was in a bombing raid or something like that. That was high from above, and it was not very personal. They didn't know what was out. I guess they didn't know. But I did see babies yeah. blown apart and stuff like that. But as far as guys in the bush, which I was a grunt, they call a ground pounder. I'd walk out in the bushes and stuff like that. Uh, we didn't shoot any kids. Mm -hmm. A lot of women. We didn't know they were women. Right. They wore the all-purpose hat. You didn't know that there was a woman, and you know, until they disrobed them or whatever. But we didn't. We didn't shoot any babies. That was part of the uh, insurrection. People who were communists that were feeding uh, this frenzy to the people to incite them. Mm -hmm. And they knew the only way they were going to get the American soldiers from there was to incite the public, the people who were the voters. And they saw an opportunity like they're doing right now. A lot of people in there are just raising havoc just to stir up stuff, but it's hard to find them. That's why I knew we'd never win that war in Vietnam. Because you never knew who you were fighting from day to day. They'd be in there cooking your food, and at night they're trying to blow your head off. And you say black people, all of them look alike. They look alike. Mm -hmm. So, and they were united, just like the Civil War, the United States. <laughs> One side wanted to be this way, the other side wanted to be that way. And the thing about it is, and if you can check your history, that there was so much corruption in the South Vietnamese government. They allowed coups, coups to happen. People would be assassinated and killed. But we were only 18, 19 years old. We were doing what our country asked us to do. I learned all that once I got to college and they started telling me all about the stuff that was going on. But anyway, yeah. that was my Vietnam experience. I don't regret it. Mm -hmm. If I knew now what I didn't know then, 
I still do the same thing. I, uh, I was born in America. And when they call on you to do a job, especially when you're military, whether it's right or wrong, <laughs> you took an oath. <laughs> Some people don't understand that. But if you don't follow the rules, then you have anarchy. And that's where a lot of the uh, veterans feel today. People don't understand it. And they never will understand it. They try to get in their minds, but you're never going to get it all. Because back in the recesses of your mind, there's something in there. They still have nightmares. They've been traumatized. You got to find a way to cope. So that's what they do every day is cope. So my final question is, what did you think of um you know, the, the honors that are happening with Camp B and getting honored for a purpose. I think it's, it's great for them to give back and recognize veterans because they're still hurting, they're still suffering. Um, I used to attend a lot of the meetings, but when they got to the point where there was just a, a B session, you know, there wasn't anything constructive about it, I stopped going. I mean, you know, unless you're doing something to help that individual right. who's homeless, who has a leg shot off and he can't feed himself. He's being evicted from his house. When people start doing something for those veterans that has those kind of problems, that's when I think that they've really got the message. I see them all the time sitting on the street, will do anything for food. And I tell them, I says, why don't you go to this place or go to this place? And a lot of them are transits from other states. They come here because in Tyler they get better, you know, uh, opportunities. The churches and everything help sure. them out and stuff like that. And uh, I asked them, and I asked them, I said, well, why are you here from Chicago or Detroit? It's cold up there, man. I don't have a house. <laughs> the weather is better down here. Sure. Things like that. And you always try to reach out and, you know, help a veteran when you want to help themselves. Some of them suffer from substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another thing that needs to be addressed. But some of that stuff is, you know, the people know about it, but they don't care. And I like organizations like this because they do care and they try. And maybe one day our government will do more for the veterans because they want to work. They used to work. They did a job. And they don't want to get a hand on They want to work. But hopefully one day they'll get it right. I may not see it, but I believe that they will. Um, when did you serve uh, in what branch? Uh, it's from 94 to 2013 U.S. Army. Wow. Yeah. And so what led up to you becoming a Purple Heart recipient? A suicide bomber with about a ton of explosives hit our perimeter fence. Um, next to our mess hall. I just happened to be in the mess hall trying to eat lunch and uh, the building collapsed on us. So that's where I earned my Purple Heart, that whole, and I got hit with RPG too while I was doing some working on casualties. So yeah, yeah <laughs> lots of fun. Well, I mean, so since you've been out, is it, what's it like trying to adapt? Because that was a long time to be, you know. In, in the military? Yeah. Well, good thing was I was in the guard, so yeah. I still, you know, Still had it there. Uh, since I've been out, my wife has helped me a whole bunch. Uh, a lot of friends, made a lot of friends, uh, volunteering to help do a lot of stuff. Uh, I've helped up here at Camp B. Uh, I've helped quite a few other vets when they've had issues. So that keeps me centered. I also have a pretty decent sized family and I uh, train hunting dogs. So that actually keeps me really centered and still hunting, fishing, trying, you know, I try to keep myself busy, I guess, and raising a family definitely will keep me busy. As the young guy. <laughs> That's what's sad around it, here. Is it, fun, is it fun, though, to meet so many other veterans and hear their stories here? Oh, yeah. I mean, these, these guys fought a war that was so totally different, extreme-wise, in how the country was at the time the lack of support for them versus what we get now. We need equipment, we get it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's a volunteer army now versus back then. You had all kinds of weirdness going on. The military was in transition and these guys, you know, dealt with it and still fought a war and 
won the war as far as I'm concerned.